Hi, everyone. I hope you are hearing me loud and clear. Um, my name is Melinda Hinkson. There are quite a few people I haven't met here tonight. Wonderful to have you all here at the Institute of Postcolonial Studies. We are really delighted to be hosting this event that is arena-led, first of two important discussions this month and next month. Um, I'm going to hand over to Alison Caddick very soon to um, introduce our panel, but before I do, let me acknowledge that we're meeting tonight on Aboriginal land, on Wurundjeri country, and pay respects to um, custodians, to landowners, to all of the people who are working incredibly hard on um, the issues that we're talking about tonight. We could name all sorts of organisations that many of us are involved in, um, some of whom will be coming to us for another range of discussions later in the year. So um, I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to continue this, these discussions between ARENA and IPCS. Let me also acknowledge all First Nations people joining us tonight. Alison Caddick, I think, is known to most of you as the editor of ARENA Quarterly, and she is your chair for this evening. Please welcome Ali. Okay, hi everybody and thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, yes, as Mel said, this is the first of two discussions, another one in a month's time. Tonight is focused on nuclear power and the nuclear push and the next one will be on AUKUS. Um, so we'll be letting you know about that one in between time. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we um, titled tonight uh, discussion setting the world on fire, which I think speaks to our fears and our fear, arena people's fear, but also to the existential issues that lie at the heart of the nuclear development generally. Um, the subtitle is the nuclear, the new nuclear push, and that speaks to the politics of the nuclear uh, issue today. So every day, listening to uh, early morning radio, someone's pushing the new smart nuclear technology, small scale. It's being spruced pretty, pretty strongly by the coalition, which is, uh, you know, recently discovered its uh, low emissions uh, anti climate change <laughs> credential. Um, it's being spruced by the in nuclear industry, especially. But um, it's the general common sense is a sort of high tech response to climate change and emissions reduction. Um, in general, it's a pretty hard. Uh, it's pretty hard out there in the world uh, to resist this kind of argument. Um, the nuclear necessity, inverted commas, is of course obvious in Labor's AUKUS commitments to nuclear subs and ongoing struggles and strategies over radioactive waste storage. Um, and, of course, it's also on the agenda of many Greens these days, which I'm sure will come up in discussion as well. Um, so, broadly speaking, and I'm probably uh, stealing somebody's thunder here, but um, the new nuclear push fits with the mainstream's ongoing incapacity to envision any form of society and economy other than a slightly green tinged, tinged version of the present model. Um, and in fact, it's um, incapacity to come to grips with um, the climate catastrophe. So anyway, that's just sort of broadly setting the context and the scene from the politics to the big cultural issues with a focus on nuclear power, um, not just on nuclear warfare. So tonight our speakers are all experts in various ways and they address the questions alike the fictions, fantasies and commitments of those arguing for new nuclear. Um, and that will be especially taken up, I think, by Darren Durant. Um, the unspoken catastrophic consequences of nuclear technology in Australia and elsewhere. And I think Karina especially will be speaking about that and John Hinkston. Um, present and past struggles to bring more conscious awareness to the nuclear option, which will certainly bring Jade Sweeney in on that. And um, John, I think we'll be speaking at the end on the more general question of what sort of society are we living in in the, in the nuclear age. So over to Darren first. He's um, a senior lecturer in science and technology at Melbourne Uni, and he's widely published 
on the relation between experts and citizens in democratic decision making, disinformation and democracy, climate and energy politics, and nuclear waste disposal. Thanks very much, Darren. Okay, thanks, Alison. Um, is this loud enough for the? Yeah. I'll just yell, John. Could I just um, say housekeeping? Everybody's going to speak for 10 minutes. So if there are any clarifying questions after the speech, <laughs> we'll take a clarifying <laughs> question, <laughs> right? <laughs> Otherwise, we'll hold um, question and discussion until the four have spoken. Okay, thank you for the invite. Um, first, a little bit about, about myself. I... Um, I'm a sociologist and a political theorist of science and technology. Um, I did a PhD project um, a couple hundred years ago on nuclear waste disposal. Um, and so what I thought I'd focus on today is what I want to call the kind of three immaturities which we can see within the Australian nuclear industry and which we can also see within our own domestic discussion of nuclear issues. So the first immaturity is to think about small modular reactors and how small modular reactors are actually discussed within our political discourse. And what I find interesting about it is that it reminds me of the 1960s discussion of commercial nuclear reactors as a host of nations, the UK, uh, France, uh, the US originally, were developing large scale, you know, 500, 750 megawatt uh, reactors in the 1960s. And one of the interesting things you saw is that there was a, a serious amount of technological progressivism about these kinds of devices. So they were imagined as these um, uh, abundant energy machines and the energy problem was thought of as we need a lot of energy and these devices produce a lot of energy. And they produce it in a centralized place and then we can ship it out, right? And so no one really has to come to this particular place, we can ship the power out to them. And to give you an historical example in Canada, so I lived in Canada for 17 years. That's where I did my project on nuclear waste disposal. Uh, the early name for nuclear reactors in the late 1940s was not nuclear reactors. It was portable hydro machines. So Canada had a lot of hydropower. Quebec had a lot of hydropower. And Ontario was faced with the problem of a growing manufacturing sector. And they thought, how are we going to power this? And they thought, we don't, we can't bring Quebec's hydro power to us. The idea of big transmission lines wasn't really on the radar. And so they thought, let's just build these reactors and they're portable hydro machines. So the early discussion of nuclear reactors was this serious technological progressivism. It was a shiny artifact that could ship power out to other people and you could just plant it in one particular place. And the whole iconography of nuclear reactors was around the idea that they will be of various kinds of sizes. And so one of the things that you saw was that the early imagery was always of a nuclear reactor way out in the middle of nowhere in some rural area. And you would see dad and the kid or mum and the kid walking along some rural <clears throat> road and there was a reactor in the distant background. And so the idea was that these reactors would form the backbone of society, but they just probably be kind of there as this subtle community member somewhere. And as the iconography of nuclear reactors went on, you started getting the idea that reactors would be, you know, the equivalent of our modern microwave. They'd just be sitting in your kitchen doing something. They'd be powering your car, for instance, forget hybrids. You'd have a nuclear reactor in your car. You'd have nuclear flying machines. And that was the whole imagery of nuclear reactors in the 1960s, even though they were mm. complex machineries that were huge and required large um, escarpment zones around them, for instance, even though the iconography depicted everyone was walking past them, no one walked past any kind of reactor it, and in the early designs in the 60s. So what we see with small modular reactors now is a straight reproduction of that kind of imagery. The small modular reactor is discussed as this utopian kind of device that because it can be relatively small, it can be anywhere from 15 megawatts up to 300 megawatts. That means that you can place it in any old place. And you're starting to see discussions of small modular reactors will be in the bottom of your hospital, for instance, like an old in Canada, they have slow poke reactors, which are 10 megawatt reactors. And you're starting to see the outbreak of this kind of idea that we will have small modular reactors that are kind of like Lucas Heights put under your university or put into your hospital, for instance. Right? So all these 10, 15, 20 megawatt reactors that can be put in serial construction and make up a big reactor, and that, that's how you get a centralized thing. <clears throat> 
Now, I want to say this is a form of immaturity because the nuclear industry realized that this language and presentation of nuclear reactors didn't work. As reactors became modular, as, as reactors became commercialized, especially in French production, it became standardized, it became bigger, and you wanted to keep them away from people because of the weapons link, for instance. So the nuclear industry, as it matured, it started treating reactors with respect. It's a really complex machinery that takes a lot to operate, and you've got to be quite secretive about it. And you've got to imagine that this device can go wrong, and you've got to you've got to have a whole you know Alara principle, you know the, the worst possible accident. You've got to try and plan for that. But with small modular reactors, the 1960s imagery is, is coming back. Now, the first immaturity is that if it didn't work in the 60s, it's very unlikely to work now. So I think that what we should expect to see is that our discussions of small modular reactors are going to run into the same problem that the nuclear industry faced in the 1960s of trying to make a really complex, potentially dangerous technology um, malleable and something that people can feel is cute and cuddly. And that's not going to work. So the first immaturity is there's an outbreak of technological progressivism again, and it didn't work before. And it's not going to work again. So that means if you're opposed to the nuclear project, one way to do that is to, and at a general point here is, we always have this idea of, you know, um, pro-nuclear people, they're going to say something, and maybe you want to object to them. I say, no, don't bother. Just let them speak. They'll shoot themselves in the foot with their technological progressivism. Right? The second immaturity is around waste disposal. So one of the things that uh, characterize late 1960s, early 1970s nuclear waste disposal plans is that it was always around engineering your way around the environment, right? So if it was in most nations opted for some kind of granitic rock because it has low fracture zones. And so you would try and design a canister so that you don't quite know exactly what the fracture zones are going to be in, a, in some granitic rock, even though it's relatively low. You don't quite know what the hydro... Uh, flows are going to be so there's so much stuff that you don't know so what do you do you make a canister that no matter what happens the canister will live so in sweden they focus completely on the canister it didn't work in france they focus completely on the canister at bure it didn't work in the u.s because they always like to try and do things their own particular way they said screw that let's not focus on the canister let's focus on this big salt dome the salt dome didn't work at yucca mountain either and so through the 70s and 80s, they had one feature was technological where you just try and engineer your way around the environment. So you don't really have to know what's going on with the environment if your canister is good. And it didn't work anywhere. And the other feature, of course, was decide, announce, and defend. So the French did it at Bure. The Americans did it at Yucca Mountain. The Canadians did it um, uh, in northern Ontario. They pretty well just selected a site and said, let's just go there. Now, of course, we've just seen that happen in Australia with the recent federal court decision to say, no, you're not going to place this site in Kimber. And they found apprehended bias, which is a legal way of saying that Matt Canavan and the other idiots in the coalition had just decided to announce to put the place in Kimber, the waste disposal site in Kimber, and had sham consultation. Now, the interesting thing, and it's a compliment for the nuclear industry, is that after this debacle of the 1970s, trying to engineer your way around nature, then just doing decide, announce, defend with a site, what they realized was that they had no social license to operate. And so most nations with a nuclear program, they built very large, complex, sophisticated um, consultation processes. And they spent about 40 years trying to do that. But Finland did it, and it took about 30 years for Finland, but they finally got Onkelo uh, through. The Swedes had about 50 years, but they finally got um, uh, Oscar Sharm through. And so in all of those cases, they figured out that they had to have some real life consultation processes with potential host communities. But of course, what are we doing in Australia? We're doing decide and ask defend still, right? Um, so that's the second immaturity, right? Thinking that the waste disposal problem, and one thing you see is that now nuclear waste is being discussed like it was in the early 70s that it's easy. As long as I've got the technical stuff down, I can do it. I'll find a place. Someone will take it. It never worked. It will not work. But we're still with that immaturity as well. So the third immaturity is just the industry itself. One thing that's noticeable about the Australian industry is that we've never had a commercial nuclear power industry. And we've never had to face the problem of nuclear waste disposal. We shipped it off to France. Eventually, they shifted it, they shipped it back. 
And in the meantime, we did three design announced defends, which didn't work. So our nuclear industry simply lacks the kind of experience that you would need to, in order to really sell a nuclear project. They lack this at the commercial power level and the nuclear waste disposal level. And so for me, I would say, what's the best argument against, um, or what's the, what's the best kind of approach for dealing with you know, the so-called nuclear bros in contemporary times? Just let them speak. They'll completely shoot themselves in the foot because they're immature on technological progressivism, on waste disposal, and they're immature as an industry. They just don't know how to actually tell others what they're doing and sell to others what they're doing. Sell's not probably the best word, but they don't really know what they're doing. So I just reckon let them speak. They'll shoot themselves in the foot. So three immaturities and they're doomed. I'll leave it there. Okay, let me just clarify a question for today. Yeah, we've talked about our nuclear industry. Uh, I haven't studied this. Um, but I'm curious as to what, what constitutes our nuclear industry. Who are they? Yeah, it's in that sense, it's massively, it's massively immature because really it only has two legs to it. One, and the legs, they're literally pointing in different directions. So it's like the classic, you know, dancer with two left feet, like me, I'm a dancer with two left feet. So one leg of the, our industry is the yellow cake mining. It's basically just an extractive industry that digs something up and sells it overseas. They've, there's no sense there. So unlike, for instance, um, yellow cake mining in Saskatchewan in Canada, they were having a domestic industry and trying to fuel, fuel literally an export industry. And they really had to know how to manage the regulatory process within Canada to get uranium in the in the market and so forth. But we just dig it up and sell it elsewhere. So no way that they don't really have the skills to think about a domestic market, right? Um, and the other is that, of course, Lucas Heights, right? Cyclotrons and so forth, generating radionuclides, um, but sold to a medical industry that has a vast social license to operate. No one really worries about radionuclides sold into the medical industry for cancer research and so forth. So the two the two main legs of our industry are going in different directions. And one never had to face the problem of dealing domestically. And the other one has never had to face the problem of dealing domestically because the medical industry creates its own industry for it. And the only thing that's really added to this is, is AUKUS or AUKUS, however we're supposed to pronounce it. Um, lived in Canada for enough. I don't know how to pronounce some things sometimes. So AUKUS is this secret military like we've seen how the regulatory body is kind of going to be a, an, an, an artifact of defense for instance you know it's the classic regulatory mistake of a promoter and a regulator in the thing in the same body so even even there when you add the military AUKUS project our industry is incredibly immature mm. um so i don't think they really have the skills base mm. to do what they want to do and all that we would talk about is that even if they tried to manufacture, a, I don't even think they have the skill space to sell an argument about the economic base. That's what I mean. Like it, as a literal, they just don't have the skills. They would have to import it all to have any hope, I think. Yeah. Okay, I think we might move on to the next speaker who's going to be Dave. Um, so Dave Sweeney is possibly well known to quite a few people here. He's been active in mining resource and nuclear issues for many decades um, through his work in the media, with the media, trade unions and environment groups. He leads the Australian Conservation Foundation's <clears throat> Nuclear Free Campaign and is a co-founder of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. So over to Dave. Thanks, Alison. And um, very good to be here tonight on uh, Wurundjeri land um, and joining this panel and particularly with uh, Karina Lester in, in South Australia, a long-time colleague and collaborator. Um, yeah, look, I wanted to just touch on the landscape, both the physical landscape of, of where we are but in the political landscape of where we are with this industry in Australia at the moment. Um, and it's particularly interesting um, and important, this discussion now, because it's been animated uh, or reanimated by the elevated hype around AUKUS. And however you pronounce it, it's a bad idea. That's the long and short of that. But it's also an idea that is fueling 
um, a real enthusiasm um, about nuclear, um, including from people who should know better. So look, before we talk about that, uh, a look at the Australian nuclear landscape. As Darren said, well, the, Australia is the largest single host of uranium, which is the basic fuel for nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And we're the largest single host. We've got 35% of the world's economically recoverable uranium in this country. And um, there has been decades of people saying, if only we weren't hamstrung by red, black and green tape, we would be the Saudi Arabia of nuclear. Now, I'm not sure that that's a, you know, an aspiration to really go for anyway, but uh, the, it, they've never realised that. Every uranium project in Australia has been contested. Every uranium project in Australia has been actively opposed and there's been a range of projects, some quietly, some very noisily and publicly that have been stopped. Um, and if you looked at a map, if you put the projects that have been stopped in Australia, there's multiple ones, and some of them are high profile, like Jabaluka and Kakadu and others, <clears throat> but there's only two operating mines in the country at the moment, both in South Australia. One's massive, um, and that's BHP Billiton's or BHP's um, Olympic Dam mine, Roxby Downs. Uranium is a... Um, is a uh, one of that's a mixed ore body, gold, copper, silver, uranium, um, particularly copper, and um, so uranium is one of a suite of of minerals out of that. The other one in operating that's in commercial production now is called Beverly Four Mile in northern South Australia, small and sells just to its parent company in the US. Um, there might well be one more that moves into commercial production which has had a very chequered history, stop start since 1983, and that's called Honeymoon. The industry will call that a massive, this shows that the Australian uh, uranium sector has thrown off its shackles and is set to boom and it'll be all this talk of a, a new renaissance. It's not. It'll be a small mine stalled um, that's come back on again. Uh, there's no renaissance here. It's highly contested. It's an industry that has faced um it's won no social license and it faces significant opposition from first nations people from environment organizations and others include and a lot of um trade unions as well it also faces political and or legal bans the only states where you can mine this stuff are south australia and the northern territory the only state where this stuff is mined is south australia so the pond although there's plenty of it the pond of actually commercially activating this has been steadily shrunk. And that's a tribute to persistence and people power and resistance. Every skerrick of Australian uranium becomes radioactive waste. We export it all, like Darren said, all of it's exported, one third to North Asia, one third to the States, one third to the EU. Uh, we also export or have contracts with every nuclear weapon state, the declared weapon states, um, or, or the five, the, you know, the uh, five permanent Security Council members, all of them are uh, in non-compliance with their disarmament obligations, not recommendations or guidance, their disarmament obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So when we get industry people and political people coming around on a revolving lazy season of assurance that it's okay and it's strictest safeguards and the highest confidence, They, our countries that purchase this material are in routine and consistent breach of their obligations. We, The other side of this is waste. So the, it starts with the shovel and the barrel with uranium and it ends with the canister with the waste. <clears throat> and we have had three decades of deeply flawed and failed um, attempts to establish a national radioactive waste facility in Australia. So in 1995, I think it was, the very aptly named Federal Department, DOPI, the Department of Primary Industries and Energy, then under the tutelage of uh, or the steery of Simon Crane, um, made a decision that the best way to manage Australia's radioactive waste would what they called remote or regional co-location. So you pick a site a long way from the east coast and you have you bury low level waste that's material that needs to be isolated for up to 300 years and you store above ground 
intermediate level waste, which is material that needs to be isolated for up to 10,000 years until you work out what you're going to do with it. That's the plan, and it's been pursued with varying degrees of enthusiasm and effectiveness by various ministers of various parties since 1995. Now, over that time, there's been multiple fights at multiple sites, normally in the Northern Territory in South Australia, um, and at every time. It has been Dad, Dad knows best, decide, announce, defend, and generally what's happened is, is that people, and particularly Aboriginal people, find out that their country is being targeted with a local ABC radio report. The next day, we get a phone call, ACF or Friends of the Earth or the like, and if we don't already know those people, we go, we travel, we meet, we talk, we see areas of cooperation, areas of concern. There's a campaign. The campaign runs, runs between six months and nine years, and the campaign's successful. At massive personal cost to people and at massive community division and stress and a whole lot of stuff that people don't need in already pressured lives, but they have not been able to advance one of these facilities. And most recently, um, just recently, in uh, July, the federal court upheld, as Darren said, um, Bangla community, they, their country runs from Port Augusta down to Port Lincoln, upheld Bangla's uh, federal court challenge, said that Minister Pitt had prejudged and was biased, wasn't a fair decision-making process. And then on August 10, so quite recently, Madeleine King, the resource minister, it's a very odd situation when the resource minister or an advocate uh, minister has carriage of radioactive waste, which is not a resource of value, but rather a long-term environmental, cultural and human threat. Um, but anyway, it is managed in the portfolio of the resource minister. Madeline King announced that Labor, to their credit, would not appeal that decision and would not further advance uh, that facility siting in that region. So that's good. What we need to do now is not just ensure that the concept of a radioactive grey nomad rolls on, where you pack up the caravan and you move on to a, looking for another compliant postcode because that has been the model for 30 years. It's failed and at high cost. So what we need to do is take a breath, take a pause, use this as a circuit breaker. 95% of Australia's radioactive waste, high, uh, intermediate level and low level is at the ANSTO, Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Facility at Lucas Heights. Our nuclear regulator told the parliament recently that it can remain there secure, consistent with international best practice for decades to come. So our argument from civil society perspective is the first step in doing something right is to stop doing something wrong. You've done that by pulling back from the Kimber plan. The second step is take a pause. This stuff lasts longer than any politician. We don't need to rush. We've got 20 or 30 years safely, securely, consistently. Let's use some of that time to do what we've never had which is to have a genuine exploration of future management options. The other thing along the way with this, though, is two times there's been two serious attempts in Australia, one in the 1990s and one in the mid-last decade, to uh, open Australia up to high-level international radioactive waste storage, so global radioactive waste. <clears throat> and I can understand that if you're a nuclear utility in Seoul or Tokyo or somewhere, um, Australia looks a, a long way away. You've got to like that. B, sparsely populated, white, politically and geologically stable. So spend money, ship the stuff off and clear the decks and carry on with business as usual. Two times there's been attempts, one by Pangea Resources or Pangea Consortium and one under the Weatherall, uh, Jay Weatherall, SA Labor Government with a Royal Commission, with a Royal Commissioner, Kevin Scarce, the former governor, a Rear Admiral, uh, born in the Woomera testing zone um, and um, then schooled in the Navy, Washington, and then Royal Commissioner, who surprisingly said, let's go and embrace nuclear waste. Um, both of those times, community opposition has stopped those projects going ahead. But they will be that will be threatened again and seriously put under pressure by AUKUS because, as Darren said, for the first time, if the AUKUS plan goes ahead as the way the government proceeds and hopes, we will inherit um, radioactive waste, high-level radioactive waste from submarines, the Virginia-class submarines that are planned to be purchased from the US. That is a real concern for us as a gateway, as an enabler, as an opening 
to, you know, well, we've already got high-level waste. Why don't we take more? We've already got our own. Why don't we take the world's or at least our walkers' partners? Because the interesting thing in this is that after at least six decades of commercial nuclear operations and military operations, neither of our walkers' partners have solved, sorted or come close to sorting the radioactive waste issue, either military, where you've got submarines tied up on the Clyde and everywhere else, or civil, which is a major problem. The other thing then is what's this about driving the domestic nuclear power agenda? So we've got the coalition clearly adopting nuclear, and it's an issue that enables them to unite the techno-libs and the dino-nats. So the techno-adopters, liberals, go, this is bright, shiny, new, it's eco-modernism, et cetera, et cetera, and we don't have to do much to the fundamental fabric of society because apparently you can turn off coal and turn on nukes. So they like that. And the renewable-hating wing of the National Party, which is considerable, the Barnaby Joyce and the, and the Matt Canavans, they can say they, they know that renewables are very popular, so they know that if you just bag renewables all the time, it doesn't play well. So they can say this is essential because renewables, even though we love them, and I've got solar on the house myself, that sort of thing, they can't rely on them. This is the heavy lift. This is the, the lift underneath that gives us certainty that we need to have Australian families and Australian family farms. So it's turning into a political culture war. Labor and the Greens are opposed to nuclear power. There's federal legislation in both the EPBC, the Federal Environment Laws, and the RPANS Act, which is our national regulator, nuclear regulator. Both of those pieces of federal le legislation have prohibitions on domestic nuclear technology, including domestic nuclear power. That's long been hated by the Mineral Council of Australia and by others, and they've long uh, attempted to overturn those prohibitions. Most recently, in the last sitting week of last year, Matt Canavan moved a motion in the Senate to repeal those two pieces of legislation. That was referred to committee. That committee reported in August along party lines. Greens, government, some of the crossbench, um, no role for nuclear in Australia and gave eight reasons why. Coalition, we needed to go nuclear 20 years ago. We have to go nuclear today. So that will uh, grow ahead of COP, the Conference on Parties, ahead of the next federal election. Uh, but there's some interesting points in this. And if we're picking up an immaturity, the immaturity that I see is no one who is advocating that Australia embrace nuclear power, not one. The Minerals Council, Barnaby Joyce, Matt Canavan, any of them, Ted O'Brien, no one is saying that we should embrace, adopt and use the nuclear technology that is in existence today. Nuclear power delivers around 9% of the world's electricity today, but no one's saying we should build them. They're seen as high cost, high risk, inflexible, long lead time, lacking social license, etc. So the entire let's go nuclear argument is based on a technology that is not in commercial deployment anywhere in the world. So these people who are saying that renewables don't work, the fastest growing sector in Australia and the world are saying your renewables don't work, so we'll need to embrace nuclear. And there is not one light globe running in the world off these small modular reactors. So I, I'm a great fan of enthusiasm, but not when it comes to your national energy policy. So I think that's a really strong point too, because the reactors that exist are not being promoted or requested by even the most strong proponents and the reactors that don't exist don't exist. They're not going to keep beer cold or water hot. So that's sort of the scope of where we are and it's just as important from our perspective to see AUKUS. There's a host of problems with AUKUS and I know you've got another forum here in a month with people much more skilled and and voiced in that than me, but there's weapons problems, sovereignty problems, cost, US war fighting, enmeshment, all sorts of things. But from the perspective of ACF and civil society groups, environment groups concerned about nuclear, we're really concerned about two aspects in particular. One, the high level waste and what that means for a country that has for 35 years failed to manage low and intermediate. And particularly given that the proposal is that it be done 
run by defence, responsible to the Minister of Defence. Secrecy and radiation is a very bad combination. The second concern we have is AUKUS as an enabler, as a motivator of domestic nuclear. Let's go, you know, we need more uranium to fuel the new nuclear future. We need domestic nuclear power. Surely if we're spending $360 billion to have these things at sea, we can talk about putting them on land, et cetera, et cetera. And we're already seeing the Fin Review, Sky News, The Australian, constant chatter. So we need constant vigilance. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, sorry. Yes. Out here. Um, yes. So, any small clarifying questions? Will we move on? Okay, we'll move on. Um, well, uh, we're very, very pleased and honoured to have Karina Lester with us tonight. We can't. I can't see you yet, Karina. There you are. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much for being here. Um, Karina is a Yankanjara, an Anangu woman who grew up in the Anangu Pichinjara lands in far northwest South Australia. Um, Karina shares not only her late father, uh, Yami Lester's story, and I think we all remember Yami Lester over uh, many long years ago, uh, but also her grandmother's story of the emu field nuclear tests in October 1953. Um, I believe that you've been a long time campaigner, uh, Karina, and we're very pleased that you're here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, and and great to see some friends of mine that have been true companions over the many years that we've been campaigning in. Um, thank you, Dave, and I'm very honoured to be part of this panel as well. I'm coming in from my traditional lands, the Yanguindara country, um, where my late father, Yami Lester, grew up. Um, but I'm actually coming from the very location of where the ground shook and the black mist rolls. So I'm right here at the place where there was great fear by Arnongo and Dad's people when the emu fields test went off, so totem one and totem two. And it'll be the 70th anniversary coming up on the 15th of October this year. So it's a very mixed emotional time leading up to it. Um, and also on that day, I think it'll be quite emotional because I'm very much right in it being here on country of what happened 70 years ago as well. Um, my story, I guess, is a real generational story because it's been something passed on from my grandmother, who I have as my screen on the back behind me, Nana Eileen Gumbelwater Brown, who was very instrumental in the Air 81D campaign um, that took place in 1998 through to 2004. And as Dave mentioned, it's been years and years of fighting and campaigning and you know, taking a lot of people's lives, um, having to draw that energy to try and fight these things that are constantly ongoing. And in our family case, it's a generational story. So Nana's been a fighter. Um, my late father spoke up about the British nuclear testing that happened in 1953, yeah. and there was that Royal Commission. Um, and then Dave also mentioned about the Royal Commission that was run in South Australia, which I was heavily involved in as well. And again, another generational fight for myself in that Royal Commission to um, speak up very strongly about the impacts felt by my people back then in the 50s. And of course, Arnongo Bujanjara and Yangunjara people who were exposed to the British testing program in the 50s and 60s, because from emu fields, they then travelled south to Maralinga and they continued with their testing program down there. And many of my grandmothers, so Nana's Gumbelwater's family from Ildor area and down to Maralinga Jaroja um, had experienced a lot of the concerns from all the testing program there as well. So um, it has been a, a challenging time and I think I'd sort of come in my my decades of of campaigning really was the inspiration of 
of Nana and her story in the Erradi Wandi campaign, but also knowing Dad's story as well and continuing to stand up for what is, you know, culturally our country and our traditional lands and, and country that we are very much part of and connected with as well through what we call our wabar, through our stories, our ancestral stories, and the cultural responsibilities that we have, the cultural roles and responsibilities, which is what I really saw with the Erari Wandi campaign and the Gorba Bidi Gunga Yoda, was the women had this strong urge to talk about this cultural responsibility that they had to country and the need for the protecting country for the next generation. And over my years of campaign, it's been ongoing. It's been, as Dave mentioned, it's a bit like a grey nomad moving from one postcode to another because it has come through South Australia and went up to the Northern Territory and now it's come back again. So, and, you know, the the great success of the Bungalow community and their hard struggle again, fighting against a, a very complex system and government and pressures there, they were successful. And, but, you know, there's never the time for us to sort of relax and take a breath and feel recharged you know, there's always that fear in, in the back of our mind, in our feeling, in our bodies that we are very unclear. And, you know, AUKUS is a very much a part of that as well, that fear of Australia cutting deals and, and working with other big players and big countries around the world and us being perhaps pressured to be the solution yet again for the waste issue in in this country and again on our traditional lands. So we can never really stop and take a, a deep breath and pause. As Dave's saying, we we should use this opportunity to pause and really catch our breath and have some really good, clear conversations around this. And we as First Nations people are constantly feel, feeling those pressures as well, but are also wanting to take that pause for a minute to catch our breath again for the next battle that that no doubt will will occur in the near future as well and and parts of the first nations groups here in south australia have been having conversations around that as well so my my group my young gundata people up here in the far northwest but also guga the people because of woomera being located on their traditional lands and also bungala as well because they've just come out of that court battle you know, we're already having conversations now about how we need to, again, get a strong message across that we First Nations in South Australia are not interested in any anything nuclear and no nuclear waste on our traditional lands because of the history. So Aboriginal people are always constantly impacted from testing 70 years ago with the EMU fields through to mining, as Dave mentioned, the active mines in South Australia. And now, again, the pressure of South Australia being the, the waste dump of the nation and, and the fear of South Australia being the waste dump for the international community as well. So, you know, there's successes over the years and there's been great loss over the years as well. And, you know, I do part of the work that I do trying to get a better future for my children and for my grandchildren as well, who have always been a big part of this family generational story. Um, but I hate to say it to my babies, but, you know, this this is not yet over. So we we do need to have these conversations and, and myself and my children always, because we ha are here on country, we, we know this story and we encourage, you know, us as a family to continue on to share dad's story and also Nana's story as well. So it's not a happy story, but it's such an important story and it's a big part of Australia's history and people need to know this story and the impacts felt by Arnungu and, and Aboriginal people of South Australia and of our community, which is the Arnungu, Binyanjara and Yankunjara lands. So I want to thank the organisers for this opportunity to be part of this panel and share our little story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. <laughs> um, and it's not a little story. <laughs> um, again, any quick clarifying informational questions? 
Okay, well, we'll move on then. Thanks, Karina. Again, we'll move on to uh, John Hinkson. Um, John is one of the Arena Publications editors. He's been writing on nuclear-related questions for, for some decades too, very much from a sort of cultural point of view, I guess you'd say, uh, about the meanings of the nuclear age. And um, Arena's had a very long involvement going back. I can remember a, a nuclear conference at the Malmesbury Arena block in the early 1980s and uh, anti-nuclear... Uh, protest movement involvement and especially through the arena drama group anyway that's a little bit of background over to john okay thanks um look i'm just going to say a little bit about why um, from an arena point of view we we consider nuclear technology to be quite unique and not even able to be compared with other technologies that you might consider dangerous. It's, it's, it's something that's set apart from the idea of a dangerous technology in our opinion. Um, <laughs> there, there is um, some definite signs that nuclear technology at the moment is being taken for granted uh, much more than it was. And there, there's a bit of a history of this in the past too, of course, but um, where the first reactions to the, uh, the bombing in Hiroshima were, you know, there was deep shock in the population. Um, over time, um, the this sort of fell away. And, um, of course, there's lots of testing going on and whatever. And, and um, the, the, the acknowledgement or the, the, the sense of Im the importance of the nuclear question came back into the public arena in the early 80s. Um, or early to mid eighties, um, with, with their with the attempt um, to put um, cruise missiles, nuclear um, cruise missiles, in Europe, and now since and there was a big movement in the in the eighties. So now it's fallen away again, and the initial reaction so far um, to the AUKUS proposal and and all the talk about other forms of um, nuclear technology in Australia. Um, that there you couldn't really say there's a very strong feeling as yet. Hopefully it is beginning to well up though. Um, <clears throat> so you could say there's an, an you could say there's an apparent acceptance of AUKUS at the moment, although I, I'm well aware that there's not a strong feeling amongst various circles. Um, <clears throat> um, but um, you could read that apparent acceptance in the silence that people have towards nuclear proposals. Um, it's as though they don't quite know what to say. And I think that's the truth of it. They often don't know what to say. It's sort of, it's, that's part of what I'm saying is they, they actually stand apart from, from other kinds of technologies. Um, <clears throat> but um, um You could say that that silence is is sort of an acting out in the face of the terribly terrible unknown. Um, so acceptance is possibly not the right word, um, but it would be true that um, negative responses to nuclear development take a fair bit of time to take shape. Um, I mean, I know the ups and downs, and I'm certainly not doubting what uh, Dave is saying about the the nuclear campaigns over the uh, generations. Um, I will argue that um, this is because nuclear technology um, stands to the side of what human beings have knowledge of um, or have come to terms with in the history of our species. So I do think it's a, it's a sort of a, it's a large issue, not um, not just a you know how do we handle this technology issue, and um, so silence is. Um, a first response, in some ways, it can be be a type of respect for the elemental significance of the atomic beast. But this is not the only possibility. It can also indicate indifference, because nuclear matters are regarded as just another thing in the world, increasingly composed of mounting shocks. Um, we we see one of these. Um, 
um, this one form of this indifference to nuclear um, matters with the shock of climate change, as has already been discussed to some degree. Worries about climate change um, are tending to produce a new form of silence about nuclear technologies, because there's a contradiction there. People become slightly convinced in here, not entirely, that you need to have nuclear technology in order to solve the climate question. And then the two things run against each other, and that, that reinforces a certain silence. Um, the, uh, one could say that um, the concern about the, 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 the elemental um, deterioration of climate leads to silence about the elemental significance of nuclear technology. Um, I'll, I'll argue that from this, this um, that this trivializes the nature of the challenge, but um, I'll go on and do that. It is the political and cultural response to the elemental that I'll turn to in trying to discuss both the um, bomb and nuclear energy. And this is what began to happen after the birth of atomic energy at Trinity in the US which um, some of which we saw, if you've, if you've seen the, the uh, recent Oppenheimer film, um, the, the, um, you have in that film, you have Oppenheimer quoting from the Bhagavad Gita, um, I am become death, etc. cetera. And um, as a scientist, he is making this announcement, which is a way of marking off the significance of the first detonation. Um, <clears throat> So to do to mark that off, it goes back to founding myths, capture the deeper significance of what had happened. Um, Robert Junk um, reported in his book, this is back many years ago, Brighter Than a Thousand Suns, on multiple examples where scientists and other intellectuals reached out to metaphor to capture not only the significance of the atomic event, including its capacity to unleash powers that were largely unknown, but also to mark the beginning of a new world. One response to using metaphor in this way has often been, been to dismiss it as being sort of just inappropriate. Um, certainly, if, if not dismissed outright, the promise of a new world associated with atomic energy is seldom explored further. And this is a form of silence. A step into metaphor is followed by not knowing what to say about what it means for the practical world of how we should live after the bomb. On the other hand, you could say that the sciences have simply done it by promoting their baby, which is nuclear energy. While the bomb is often responded to with fear, nuclear energy and the peaceful atom is treated as quite different, as something special. No matter what the latest crisis of nuclear energy might be, however battered nuclear energy might be, uh, or it might appear to be after, uh, say, Three Mile Island or Chernobyl or Fukushima, the practice of nuclear energy is protected and always re-emerges in as bad as, as it may look. Um, <clears throat> While it does fuel a number of economies, nuclear energy that is, there is something more here. You could say it is also a grounding, grounding artifact, artifact of the new world. At ARENA, the claims of nuclear technologies presaging a new world have been taken very seriously. We understand things in social terms or through social relations. We think the new world is one constructed by science and intellectual practices as part of their collective social endeavor. And first of all, there are intellectuals who engage in abstract practices theory construction like that of Einstein and his cohorts. And secondly, theory is actualized in atomic technology, a practical outcome of this theory. From this standpoint, this was and is a very novel development. Intellectual practices by virtue of their deep grasp of nature have bridged into the practical world of production of economic value. Academics become practical as it were contradicting how we have previously understood their very being in the world. And this is the birth of what we call technoscience. Of course, atomic technology is not the only expression of this process. In fact, many of the scientists in the 20th century 
and guide in this deep unlayering of natural processes, generating theories that challenge the common sense world. Biotechnology, which challenges much of our common sense, under, our common sense understanding of the body, is the scene of much of this work. Um, <clears throat> um, where unknown levels of natural process are uncovered and made ready for practical transformation. So without bothering you with the complexities of these arguments, it should be said that in going down this transformation road of exploring the unknown, we are likely to encounter difficulties that are completely novel, not just for this or that person, but for our species in the world. And this has certainly happened with this with biotechnology, and it and um, and it first happened with atomic energy. I don't want to spend any time on the dangers of atomic bombs; they are obvious, and they're a threat to our ex our existence as they've always been. The more we know, the greater the threat. It's an appropriate equation, but the more we know, it also applies to low-level waste as brilliantly disclosed by Kate Brown in her book, Manual for Survival. She's shown how research into such matters has become impossibly compromised by the political scientific commitment to regard atomic technology as special or what I'm calling a grounding artifact. Not only did she know that, the, that one major effect um, um, of overexposure to nuclear radiation, thyroid cancer, emerged on a large scale after Chernobyl. She reports the likelihood of over 100,000 deaths in, in the areas around Chernobyl, which includes Belarus. Um, but actually thyroid cancer, because she researched up in that area for years and um, was um, reporting on things that other scientists weren't. Crucially, thyroid cancers were rising significantly in the same region around Chernobyl well before the disaster. Um, here she's pointing to the cavalier attitude towards low-level radiation produced by nuclear energy um, plants in normal periods, even if there is no accident. This cavalier attitude is widespread and is reflected in leading works like that of um, James Lovelock of Gaia fame, who thinks that radiation in the general environment is a fact that justifies nuclear energy. It was also reflected in the experiments of on general populations in the Pacific and in Australia, as well as in the US heartlands, where research by the US National Cancer, Cancer Institute, <clears throat> previously kept from the public, reveals huge numbers of thyroid problems across much of the continent related to nuclear testing in Nevada. So I'm going to finish up now, but Kate Brown considers this openness towards nuclear energy to be slowly um, poisoning our world for future generations. She concludes, Western researchers are discovering, like Soviet scientists before them, that radioactive decay at low um, doses changes the way cells behave in subtle and life-changing ways laying the basis for chronic radiation syndrome, which she regards as a crime. I think that the world we have entered, composed of the technosciences, is a very dangerous one. It's a world um, far too dependent on the novel and completely unfamiliar discoveries of the scientists who have not yet learnt the necessary limits of their craft when they encounter the world exposed by their new techniques. Scientists and the population more generally have to come to terms with the fact that in many respects, we are now encountering powers that are beyond the capacity of the species to control in a safe manner. Um, I mean, that's my argument. I'm not, not quoting anyone there. Um, that our world increasingly takes the form of endless stockpiles of nuclear waste hidden from sight should focus our minds. We have no safe solution for such waste. It's producing a world of decay for species, for species life and illustrates the challenges posed by the nuclear age. But this is only one example of the challenges the world of techno science presents to the world.
Okay, thanks very much, John. Okay, so we'll just open things up to general discussion and any questions that you might like to ask. <laughs> Uh, Steve, yes. Oh, refresh oh. Oh. Where's the other mic, please? A refresher on Synroc, please. Yeah, it was earlier. Synroc solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, so the question is Synroc, the status of Synroc. Synroc is synthetic rock um, developed by Professor Ted Ringwood in Australia and uh, was seen as uh, a challenge to the French uh, glass classification approach using a ceramic that would isolate radioactive material from the surrounding environment. Um, there's a Synroc uh, demonstration plant at Ansto's Lucas Heights facility. Uh, there's an elevated Synroc um, development program at Ansto um, and they are really betting heavily that Synroc will be able to manage Ansto's waste and then become um, a commercial uh, solver of international radioactive waste. Massive um, technical difficulties uh, continue to face that and um, they haven't had... Um, anywhere near the breakthrough that they've hoped for. They still speak glowingly of it, but it's not really isolating anything that's glowing inside it. I guess um, the reason I mentioned glassification is because glassification was proposed in the early 70s. Um, and so Synroc is really just the latest version of glassification, and therefore it inherits the same problem for waste disposal that glassification had, which is that the volume is much larger. So you're still taking a whole bunch of fuel canisters, but the volume in the repository is probably anywhere up to 10 times larger. And so the problem that you would inherit here, and this is why classification was dumped, was because the site would have to be so much bigger. The site underground, the boreholes, more boreholes, more uh, drilling, the top surface area would have to be much, much larger. So I don't see how Synroc solves that problem. But I will say that what it does do is it returns to an idea that you can't trust the bedrock or you of some kind because everyone's ditched um, everyone's everyone's ditched um, uh, sand basically. So if you went for for bedrock, you still can't solve the problem. So they're still trying to engineer through synroc or glassification, right? And it's a return to this idea that you can't trust the bedrock. So why not just put a big block of ceramic or a big block of glass? Because then you don't have crevice corrosion in the canisters. If you don't have crevice corrosion in the canisters, you don't have microbial action opening up the canisters. That's really what it's trying to do. But it will never solve the fact that your site has to be five to 10 times bigger. So I, uh, my, I would say they'll keep talking about it, but it's not going to go anywhere. Okay. Thanks. Well, I've read it, read the claim that contrary to what the nuclear industry says, nuclear energy involves huge, even phenomenal volumes of carbon emissions going into it. Um, you know, nuclear reactors are largely made of out of concrete, which is CO two intensive. Uh, and then in the actual process of separating out different radioactive materials and then restoring all the waste, uh, that involves massive amounts of CO2 and chlorofluorocarbons. But then I I bring this up because then I've heard other people claim the newest generations of nuclear plants coming online now, that's, that's not a problem with them. They just don't uh, cause carbon emissions on that scale. So I'm just wondering if a panelists could just clarify for my sake what the deal is with uh, what the deal uh, is with nuclear energy and uh, carbon emissions including the newest generation stuff um we can tag team on it but one thing i would say is that i'm actually not convinced that we should bother too much with um, life cycle emissions nuclear and renewables because actually most independent estimates don't put them too far away from each other 
once you include life cycle emissions. And what I find interesting about that is that what has happened is that in the renewable sector, there are new there are new principles and new guidelines there to try and measure life cycle emissions because everyone in the renewable sector knows that you can't ignore the minerals extraction and talk about life cycle emissions. So they don't even try, you know, whereas oil extraction, you know, coal, et cetera, et cetera, they often left that stuff out. So the renewable sector has embraced this and said, let's do the whole life cycle emissions, right? And the nuclear sector has come around late to the party and said, we can do it too. The numbers don't end up drastically different on the life cycle emissions. And that's as a nuclear critic, right? And what's interesting about it is whether the nuclear industry will continue to adopt the same kind of life cycle emissions and the principle behind that, which is accounting for everything, which they used to reject. So will they now extend it into decommissioning and into uh, recycling operations and into waste disposal? Because right now they've actually stopped it temporarily. Their life cycle emission, they actually don't go into decommissioning. And they do that for a particular reason, because in most cases, decommissioning is sold off to another company. Another company, some shell company, sold off. The waste is sold off for two bucks. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to offload the back end of it. Whereas if they followed the renewables industry, the re renewables industry is saying, well, we've got the back end too. So I think, the, I think we'll find that the life cycle emissions are not too far from each other they're not orders of magnitude um although the nuclear industry still hasn't got into the decommissioning part so the only thing that i'd add is that um you're absolutely right in the sense of um one thing that is really frustrating is when people say nuclear is uh carbon three the only point where it's carbon free is the generation in a control chain reaction in the reactor that doesn't release carbon that but every bit before operation. the operation every bit before every bit after does and your points are absolutely right you made the point about the um next generation um and what you know there's claims the germans have a great saying um i can't pronounce it well in german but it's no no trader cries out bad fish and um the nuclear industry is selling fresh fish even though the product is no no trader cries out bad fish okay so no one sells down what they're trying to promote and um and that's certainly the case with next generation technology but i would say that yes it is they are zero carbon because there's zero electricity because they exist in people's minds or on drawing boards or in platforms so a hypothetical reactor is zero carbon on the only other thing was I'll add as an anecdote is I read something from Barnaby Joyce a couple of months ago. I know, painful, but I read something from Barnaby Joyce and he was talking about uh, a new scale, small modular reactor that someone had proposed to put up in the in the New England area. And he's like, hey, it's only like two by two meters. It is not two by two meters, right? I mean, that's orders of magnitude off. So he could get a small life cycle emissions out of that because he, it's... Like the the canister is two by two meters, but the rest of the facility is. So I think that's we're getting that as well, right? But I think that kind of bad faith stuff. Uh, to be honest, most large scale nuclear vendors have went for full life cycle emissions, uh, except for decommission. So they're not Barnaby Joyce's. Okay, sorry, Mark. Yep, and then uh, it, this is a really dear question. Uh, um, bouncing off what you were saying, John, that we don't really know what we're dealing with about nuclear. We just, we, 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 our sensibilities are just miles away from the realities there and that. There just is such a pattern of fantasy about all of this. Sorry, uh, there's such a, an absolute kind of succession of fantasies that are getting played out, uh, uh, it seems, with uh, um, this. Um, didn't the French and the Americans say they were going to sell nuclear to Iran um, in the 1960s. And there's just an ongoing kind of seam of the AUKUS stuff. Nobody knows what the submarines are going to look like. They haven't been designed. Nobody knows, as several people, several of you have said, how these new generation machines are going to actually exist. They're, they're fantasies again, uh, uh, the, the smaller reactors. What's going on that we're so 
entranced by the fantasy here? Well, actually, Darren was talking about this earlier. One of the techno fantasies, and um, I think that's, I mean, that's pretty widespread. That you know, technology will save us one way or another, and now we're coming up against the limits of that. I mean, you can see that with climate change too, where you know, technology is supposed to save us, and technology will feed the will feed the populations as they get larger and larger. Um, you know, nine billion now, and heavens knows what they'll be in uh, 50 years' time, and um, I, I don't think they should be believed. He, but what else can I say there? Um, um, I was going to say something else, but anyhow. Oh, I was just going to say that it's it's kind of like, obviously, we know it at one stage, it's a hype cycle. And so what I find intriguing about that is that we have a really well-established industry that has reimagined a hype cycle. And when you look at its hype cycle, it talks about a small modular reactor and says it's new enough that it that it covers, it overcomes all the previous problems with reactor construction. So it's new enough, it's a new enough device, it doesn't inherit all those old problems. But it's not so new that it doesn't benefit from all the things that we learned. I mean, this fine line balancing act, you just know it's bullshit. Right. Mm -hmm. So to have that fine line balancing act as part of a hype cycle, because you can look at most kinds of hype cycles and no one's trying to toe the line that much. So I just think if you look at it, I imagine, for instance, economic historians who do hype cycle analysis, they would look at it and go, no, 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 no. We haven't seen something this bullshit before. Pretty sure. And I'm not an economic historian, but. Okay. Hang on. I've got several people. So Sorry. Okay. Um, then, then my friend over there, no, and then Guy, and then Liz. Hey, um, my name's Joe. My question's awkwardly for Dave. Hey, Dave. Um, I think for anyone else who knows as well, um, I'm in the Australian Education Union, and I'm getting organised into anti-nuclear activity by an acquaintance at the moment. And I was wondering, landscape of anti-nuclear kind of activism in the unions because there's unions and there's unions like when it comes to these things I was just wondering if you could delineate that a bit for me from what you know I'm a bit nervous to talk about that one the question was union activism on on uh, nuclear free or anti-nuclear and I'm a bit nervous in august company because it's a really long history complicated long and generally proud um but basically uh, there is a there is strong opposition. I, I think there's a general tendency in trade unions, organised trade unions, to be uh, cautious and circumspect of nuclear, at least. Um, in many cases, strongly opposed, and in a couple of notable cases, in favour. Now, in the current landscape, the notable fa case that's in favour is the AWU. The Australian Workers Union is in favour of of basically full bore nuclear, um, AUKUS, high level waste, nuclear power. Um, unfettered uranium mining. Um, their position is not, um, they're, they're very much an outlier in the union movement, but their position also has the effective role of neutralising um, active ACTU position because the ACTU has a policy of consensus. So like if our affiliates uh, don't agree, all agree, then we won't, we might have a sort of guidance principle, but not an active campaign. Um, there are many unions, though, that are very active, and in particular, I point to the AMWU, the Manufacturing Workers Union, the Old Metals, um, and the MUA, the Maritime Union, very strong, and particularly one that we work with very closely and very effective um, is the ETU, Electrical Trades Union. And that's really interesting because, you know, many people are saying, well, why wouldn't the ETU get on board if this means new dollars in the power sector? But they are absolutely strongly opposed to nuclear and they led the charge against AUKUS and a range of nuclear things at the recent ALP national conference. Um, there's a lot of the service unions like teachers, uh, nurses and midwives, um, a lot of the health sector unions are strongly anti-nuclear. Um, so like I think the general sense is there's like there's a really proud union history of, of opposition to handling and transporting uranium mining. There's been previous really strong bans and positions taken. 
it's got more complicated now with, you know, secretary boycott stuff and all sorts of difficult about protected actions and that. But there is a there's a reservoir of strong support. I also am engaged in ICANN, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and industrial labour trade unions are very powerful supporters of that initiative. So you're in good company. And as they introduce under the guise of STEM and particularly under the guise, cynical guise of engaging young women in science, you know, a design your own subclass in schools, I'm joking you not, in schools right around the country, that is that whole thing that John made about normalising. A lot of this is about normalising the abnormal or normalising what shouldn't be normal, you know, um, and I'll leave it at that. Could I just also add a really geeky answer? There's a French historian, Gabriel Hecht, who wrote a book called Radiance of France. And the second book after that, which I cannot think of the title right now, unfortunately, um, but Radium, Radiance of France covers um, up to the Mesmer plan of 1974. And the second book covers afterwards. And it covers, um, it includes the South African uranium trade. And one of the things that she talks about is union movements and the casualization of labor at nuclear facilities. Mm -hmm which is done purely so that you can lower the radiation dose right? or actually rate, sorry, raise the radiation dose. So casualized workers are going from one nuclear facility to another and collectively getting way more than their 20 millisieverts per annum. They're getting upwards of hundred millisieverts per annum because the nuclear utilities are not reporting it to the regulator. And this is what happened in Japan. So I would suggest Gabrielle's second book, which talks about, Maybe not why unions are opposed, but why unions should be opposed. So, As a throwaway, I've got a colleague in New South Wales who's doing curriculum on nuclear issues, so I'll give you a contact later on. Um, I'm not sure if Karina's still there. Uh, okay. Or maybe I'll make a comment rather than a question. I mean, one of the things that's missing in the discussion tonight is about the international view of Australia in this discussion. You know, we are actually being watched at the moment. And I don't know if people saw it yesterday, the um, Australian embassy in Tokyo did a little video where they cooked Fukushima fish um, to show that it was safe to eat. And this is the 21st century equivalent of diving to the lagoon at Mururoa Atoll. Um, and your immaturity, the immaturity of the discussion in Australia is quite striking. And yet our colleagues internationally are watching this and people in the Pacific have gone berserk over this video in the last 24 hours. And it seems to me that I think one of the things that needs to be broadened in the discussion tonight and, you know, when we're doing anti-nuclear work is how people in Southeast Asia and the Pacific are looking at Australia at the moment. Because it seems to me that there is a fundamental mismatch of the debate in Australia and what people internationally are looking at, given the lived experience in the Pacific Islands of nuclear testing, given you know, the problem of deserts and oceans all around the world, which were seen as vast empty spaces for this. Um, and given the connection that many people in those vast empty spaces feel about the danger of geoengineering around climate change, um, where they see the connection between the techno fantasies and that countries like Australia, um, you know, will want to do geoengineering about climate so we can keep pumping out fossil fuels um, and where's the vast empty space nearby that might be used for geoengineering? Oh, what about the vast empty Pacific? So I, I just think it's really important for our discussion that both as a political intervention and a reality mm -hmm. that people are actually watching the debate in Australia and are more savvy about the immaturity. And people like Karina and people in the Pacific and people, you know, who've been through this and are still living with the sacrifice zones. Um, and that I just... I think that needs to be broadened out because it ties to AUKUS, you know, about how people are perceiving AUKUS, but it's also about the fact that, you know, people in the Pacific went berserk that Australian diplomats are eating Fukushima fish at a time Japan's about to start ocean dumping of um, treated contaminated wastewater from the Fukushima plant. I think that's a really important point. We do work closely with with uh, international groups, but you're absolutely right. AUKUS has really elevated attention and concern. Um, 
And also, like, we've had the foreign minister, the defence minister, the prime minister stand their hand on heart and say that AUKUS is not a precursor. Nuclear-powered subs are not a precursor to any nuclear weapons ambition or a nuclear weapons acquiescence for our AUKUS partners in, in Australia. And yet, at the last, at the recent Labor Party conference, again, they didn't give that the next logical step by signing the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which has been in their platform for five years, unlike AUKUS. Um, there's also the Fukushima connection. And one thing that was particularly galling to see the Australian fish and chip fest, which is what it was, was absurd, um, is that it was, it was confirmed to a Senate inquiry in 2011, shortly after the Fukushima accident, that it was Australian uranium that was in the Fukushima Daiichi plant when it melted down. So that Fukushima water release started as rocks in the Northern Territory and South Australia. And we should be reflecting on our role in providing the building block fuel of this material. You know, on a good day, it becomes radioactive waste that lasts 100,000 years. On a bad day, it's Fukushima. On a very bad day, it's a nuclear weapon. Like, we should be reflecting on that as a mature country, not celebrating fish fingers and saying it'll all be okay. So we're not covering ourselves in glory. You're absolutely right, Nick. Um, um, I try and um, make a comment, try and connect all of the various speakers' comments together in making a little argument. Um, it seems to me that, that what's being said about the immaturity of nuclear and the, the, the way in which we have defeated it again and again and again through immense struggle and immense sacrifice uh, is I'm a little optimistic about the linear nature, if you like, of history and how history works. And what I would suggest is that there's an implicit argument there that rationality and logic will be sufficiently expanding as we become a more scientific, more informed society to make the obvious claims of the nuclear industry, the nuclear, uh, uh, the, fish, the fish people, the fish fingers people um, look absurd doesn't seem to me to be that that's the way that history necessarily works, that history works through large eras or, you know, eras of a certain size in which common sense and logic change quite sharply from one to the next. And let me give you an example of that on the left. For half a century or so, the left the radical left, the left we most of us would identify here with here was Promethean, uh, was from for the Russian Revolution and through it connected to the idea that the domination of nature would deliver the liberation of humanity. And that was the sort of Stalinist pictures of dams and uh, all that sort of stuff. What the left became after the Second World War and uh, Hiroshima and other things eventually was what we call the new left. And the new left was people, was things like Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, cultural critics of the 50s and that sort of thing. And they brought in an entirely different idea of what it was to create the good society. And it was anti-Promethean. It was completely uh, in opposition to what had gone before. And that set up a fight between the old left and the new left. And that's, it's from the new left that the anti-nuclear movement came. And the energy of the new of the anti-nuclear movement was this deep logic that understood, however it could be articulated or not, that there was, as John was saying, something unique and special and category busting about nuclear. It wasn't just, you know, the stuff that was talked about in the 60s of pollution, clean air, da-da-da-da-da. It was a lethality that was unlimited. Now, it seems to me that there is no guarantee that that uh, paradigm that lasted for several decades and had specific reasons for existing will continue to exist. 
And there's no reason to presume that the sort of people we know who are educated, scientific, uh, smart, and that sort of thing will agree with the idea that this technology is simply too dangerous and too annihilating to contemplate. Now, let me give you a small example of one of the ways in which this sort of paradigm is shifting underneath what the left was. And that is the movement called the Yimbis, the Yes in My Backyard people. Now, this is small stuff compared to nuclear, but these are the people in Sydney and Melbourne who are arguing that the housing crisis is such that what we need to do is to throw away a lot of what the new left and social movements thought about how we build cities as livable, various, uh, rich in heritage, that sort of thing, and plain flat whole areas and build big and build high. And that the demand of that is that we need to house people, we need affordable housing, and that a lot of what is being talked about as heritage, amenity, livability, the stuff that came out of Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of the American City, which founded the sort of, that sort of modern urban new left movement, but that uh, is over. It's, it's, it's just, um, it's, it's part of a boomer elitist conception. Now that is, that is gaining tremendous traction in Sydney and Melbourne, and it's attracting the sort of people who would once have been the inner city heritage fighters, the people fighting, fighting against the freeways, fighting that sort of thing. Now, what one could see as possible, I would, it would seem to me, and I'll try and finish quickly, is that the, the possibilities that John is talking about, the, the, the very annihilatory or, you know, transformative capacity of nuclear could be adopted by a future generation that's on the left, as people like Kim Carr are pro-nuclear uh, in the ALP, um, not because of its... not despite its danger, but because of it, and that what you're calling immaturity can then be taken as audacity and celebrate the audacity, having the courage to really transform the world and take the risk. Now, after all, the left is the home of audacity. And this relates to Mark's point about fantasy and reality and, and techno science, because actually, what techno science is is the transformation of the fantasy of abstract science, if you like, an imaginary understanding of nature to the real application. And let's look at the creation of the nuclear industry and the atomic bomb. The uncontrolled train, chain reaction, you know, the uncontrolled chain reaction was discovered in 1936. There was a nuclear bomb nine years later, you know, so it went from a, a piece of pencil and paper to a world transforming technology in nine years. And this is why one would say it's not unusual that someone like James Lovelock, this category transforming scientist of Gaia would become pro-nuclear. It's inevitable. That's the actual person who will flip over. And I would say then that our real struggle in the decades to come is not gonna be with the people on the right who are way over there. It's going to be with these forces within the left and within the social movements and within the global green movement who are going to say uh, it's not just that nuclear energy is a last resort because we're smart people, because we're abstract thinkers, this is what we should heroically adopt. Um, well, I guess I would have to and uh, maybe we can go for another five minutes. Um, but Darren, would you like to respond? And um, everybody, would you like to respond to the guy? And then maybe one more question. I'll, I'll give a, I'll give a quick response. Um, one thing, let's say that I wanted to test that thesis. The people that I would look for for testing that thesis are what's usually called eco-modernists. These are center leftists, or they're just centrists. They just call themselves centrists, in other words. Um, and that's who I would look for for testing that thesis, that we're looking for someone kind of on the left, kind of. Um, they probably support support progressive causes, for instance, even if they're center of the road economically. So I'd be looking for the eco-modernists. But when I go to the eco-modernists, they do anything other than talk about audacity and courage. Most of the eco-modernists, when they embrace nuclear, say because they're worried that renewables won't be reliable enough and they're 
worried that people won't be politically pragmatic enough to buy into renewables. So, so their, their approach is not about audacity and courage. It's about small scale movements because you're worried that no one will come with you. Right? They're like little ants kind of cruising around. If I just make tiny little adjustments, I won't piss people off. So that's how I would think about testing the thesis, in other words. Look to see, can we find this kind of you know um, audacious, courageous, let's do this, it's a bit idealistic. Can we find this in anyone that's kind of center and the eco-modernists are the candidate and they're the opposite? So I do, I do wonder about whether... I can see what you mean, but I I do wonder if it runs out of steam for those eco modernists that they're they're the prime candidates right now for that. Yeah. I, I would just say, Guy, that um, I think you could um, discuss those issues um, in terms of a a conflict or a struggle between people, even in terms of the sciences. Like um, Lovelock is he's a physicist and. He's not, or was, and he's not very in touch with the ways of life of, of the general population, as I understand it. Um, I might be wrong there, but I, I think that might be the case. Um, someone like Kate Brown, who I was drawing on in my little thing, she's a different person altogether. She's very strongly in touch with the general population, with the sentiments of the times and what matters to ordinary people. And... I think that you you could you could see that as a, a increasingly turning into a conflict between two groups of people. Um, first one um, sort of really taking hold of things and making things happen radically, and I think that's the sort of situation we have to face. Where we, we've got to we've got to work this out in terms of social movements or whatever. Um, it won't, it's not just a matter of changing from one mode to another mode, I don't think. Yeah, I think it's a really, um, I think there's all sorts of potential futures and threats. And I think that um, what you've identified is possible. Um, I think what would drive that more than audacity is desperation, is that sense of like, I love the piano, but we've got to throw it overboard because climate change is here. And I think one of the challenges we have, because I, I would like to think that left and progressive people would respect the Indigenous lived experience, would be mindful and driven by intergenerational burden and legacy of waste, and would also see, I think, what's really important and what I'm seeing is, as an anti-nuclear advocate is not to be, oh, this is the rusted-on position we've always had. It's rather to say that if our choices were we power this planet by burning coal or splitting atoms, that's a discussion. That's a really hard discussion, but it's not because we've got the alternative of renewables. And it always does my head in that the pro-nuclear crew, it, I'd have more respect actually, I would be very opposed, but I'd have more respect if they say, I want to build the stuff that's working in the world today rather than saying, Renewables can't work, but this thing that's currently not in any commercial deployment anywhere can. I'm amazed that people can be techno enthusiast enough to believe that we can make a machine that can neutralise a carcinogen that's 100,000 years, but we can't make a battery that can hold a charge for a week. You know, so I would say that there are massive challenges and we can't assume that positions held now will be sustained. But I think we need to consistently make the case that the long-standing critique of nuclear remains real and that nuclear is worse than a distraction on climate change. It's actually an impediment and a diversion to meaningful and swift action. Um, this will be very brief. Uh, I just wonder if any of you would like to comment on where the money would come, the finance, the investment. Who Who is looking at the profitability of the nuclear industry? Who are the people who are doing the calculations 
as to what the profitability might be and what they stand to gain economically from an industry that um, requires certain hierarchies, requires security, requires a whole lot of um, elements that perhaps renewables don't need. Uh, and maybe that, anyway, okay, I'll leave it at that. Um, I think the first important thing there is to keep in mind that there's always direct and indirect subsidies. And so we don't want to have an argument that says renewables don't need subsidies because renewables will get direct subsidies, 100%. Um, so in other words, the battle is really about indirect subsidies. So one of those indirect subsidies is the Australian Nuclear Society has proposed to have 24 sites across the country at old decommissioned coal plants and have 24 small modular reactors. That would be 24 lots of indirect subsidies, starting with uh, nuclear liability uh, minimization. So I think the debate here is about indirect subsidies, all of the subsidies that are easy to hide. Mm -hmm. right? So there's no way a nuclear facility in this country or any country gets off the ground without government funds of some kind. That's a lock. Um, but then we have to go to direct and indirect subsidies. Otherwise, we can catch ourselves in the falsity of asserting that some renewables wouldn't get some kind of subsidy. Of course it does, um, including transmission networks. So I, I just think as long as we have a nuanced conversation about it, and I would suggest focusing on the indirect subsidies, that nuclear would vastly exceed renewables. It would need more indirect subsidies over time. Okay. Oh, you're going to say something. I'm just going to say something quickly, and that is, that is that um, um, in many ways, I don't think it is an economic question. Um, so I, mean, I don't mean you shouldn't ask the economic question and and um, um, and think about the answers. Like with AUKUS, the total would be three hundred and sixty billion. Um, if you believe that, then you believe anything because it's going to be at least at least a trillion, in my opinion. Um, but none of those things are going to influence people too much because you're talking about figures that. They've never they, they don't know how to think about um i don't know who does but uh, anyhow main thing is in my opinion is that it's it for a lot of people and i think for the sciences as well it's as well it is a deep commitment to nuclear um not economic commitment no matter what the cost they want it and be, certain military circles will be the same of course and just leave it that Okay, then that's a good point, good note to end on. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers very much, Karina, who couldn't stay. Um, Dave, thanks so much. Darren and John. Um, and um, now we can all go and have a glass of wine. There's tons of wine out there. There are peanuts. I was told to bring peanuts, so there's food as well. Um, let's go and continue the conversation there. And the next... Um, uh, discussion night is October the 4th here, same time, I do believe. Nick will be one of the speakers on that night. Guy will be one of the speakers on that night. Clinton Fernandez and um, a representative from the, yes, Jenny Ground, sorry. Um, so that should be a great uh, discussion on AUKUS proper on that occasion. Okay, so thanks very much for coming. Good afternoon.